Hello, everyone. Hi to good afternoon, both to our live stream audience and also to our audience here in the room. Thank you so much uh, for joining us today. Um, so we have a, uh, we have a packed agenda this afternoon. I'm sh I hope you were watching our, our panels and interviews early on, but we still have more this afternoon. And to be joining us this afternoon is um, Ms. Lois Space, Assistant Secretary for Global Affairs at the U.S. Department of Health and Human Services. Lois, can you please join us? First of all, thank you so much for joining us today. I know you've got a very busy schedule, so we appreciate your time. Um, I think this week, everyone's so interested, really, with the amendments to the international health regulations. We've seen the um, proposed amendments uh, by the U.S. Can you just walk us through what happened? Like, were we expecting, supposedly, some kind of adoption this week? Was that the plan, or what happened? Yeah, that's a good question. Hi, everyone. How are Hi, you? Guys. It's good to be back in the DevEx community. Um, I thought we were going to make you sing at some point. We were waiting so long to get started. So um, on the amendments, uh, uh, we were um, and we still are um, working mightily, mightily to ensure that we can make some progress on these. Let me just go back up. Um, coming into this week, uh, we in the U.S. government were really clear that we wanted to make some progress on global health security and the action we all take collectively on global health security, uh, recognizing that if we go home not having done anything, it's not really a great look, right? What did you all get together for in the middle of a pandemic after fighting this for two years only to do nothing? So um, we in the U.S. government worked with a number of other member states to really look at the existing framework for all this, the international health regulations, and try and understand what could be tweaked uh, across those um, various um, regulations. Uh, we're referring to those as proposed amendments or targeted amendments. And you're right, Jenny, coming into this week, we said, okay, we probably can't sort of even tackle all 13 of those proposals uh, in one week, but we can at least take one piece of it uh, and really just agree to the process of it all um, and walk away with that sort of success and that win. So we're still hopeful about that, um, but I can't um, bury the lead here. I know last night uh, there was an agreement for the working group um, on preparedness and response to convert into the working group on the international health regulations. So that's a really great sign from all member states that there was agreement that they would at least over the next couple of years work towards these amendments that we put forth. There were some member states were saying we want to make sure we're part of the conversation, we want to be involved. What's going to be the next process? Yeah, that's a great question. Sorry, did I cut you off? No, no, no. Okay, so um, uh, absolutely, there has been engagement um, since we um, put these amendments forward as well. This process started, really it started uh, back in 2020, so I have to give credit to many of the staff who uh, from the Department of Health, from the Department of State who've been working on this for so very long, but it really, um, picked up in earnest in the past year. And there have been ongoing conversations with various member states since then. I think it's been just really hard for everyone to be deeply engaged, again, in the middle of a pandemic. So that's the balance we were trying to strike. We wanted to take action immediately, and we didn't want to use the pandemic as, I hate to say, an excuse for waiting, because then, God forbid, we lose momentum, right? And I'm looking at Sudvir, who was involved in the independent panel on, on preparedness and response, who said, you got to act now. And we can't just wait until this is over for us to do anything, because then I think we would find ourselves not really having a lot of enthusiasm or momentum. So that said, uh, member states haven't had as much time as they'd like to really pour through everything, which is why we're happy about the working group really just saying, OK, we're going to have the next couple of years to get this done. And we're spending time this week just learning even more about people's concerns or questions. You mentioned next couple of years. and. Also, the, you know, the calls for urgency. So mm -hmm. that seemed like a, too far away. Is there a way to kind of move, the, you know, the, those kinds of discussions and decisions maybe, I don't know, next year, oh, if not yeah. this year? Have you, have you been to WHA? <laughs> Do you know how this works? <laughs> so, uh, yeah, we're like, whoa, 24 months is lightning speed. Um, well, we were trying to strike that balance this week by saying, okay, there is one baby article, Article 59, that we could put in place and 
um, decide on this week uh, to just get the ball rolling, to your point. And that article is really just about how quickly any amendments or changes come into force. Right now, they're set to take two years, right, any changes. And we were just saying, okay, can we set it to be one year? So that's the goal this week is to at least have agreement there. We may or may not get there, right? It remains to be seen. But it just goes to show um, that we actually do need, uh, you know, at least the next year to understand where we are. Maybe at the end of that year, we can accelerate that process. I don't know. This is still the UN and it's still 194 member states. Uh, and so I, we also want to be sure the process has the time it deserves for things to actually work. Well, there's another process happening, right? Uh -huh. There's talks about it, the, the INB with the pandemic instruments. Um, and I was looking at the uh, proposals made by the U.S., but one thing that I think a lot of people are curious is, where's the teeth, mm. right? Because that's one of the criticisms during this pandemic, mm. the, the whole compliance aspect. Yeah. And so um, how can these two important instruments, including the, the IHR you know, processes, um, really have strong enforcement and ensure yeah. countries will really follow through what you don't tell them, but actually what they commit to yeah. um, when they sign on to these different uh, agreements or instruments. No, that's really important, right? Because um, even the IHRs are have binding elements or are binding unto themselves. And so that is helpful in terms of teeth. Um, we don't know yet what form this new instrument will, will take. Uh, one of our concerns is that uh, it's so um, that to make it binding and to say it's binding outright might almost um, sort of uh, drive member states to work towards the lowest common denominator. That, so that's a risk, I think, um, in saying, okay, we already know that this is going to be something that binds us and everyone's going to be held accountable in this way. And thus, you can get into a room with people and say, well, then I don't really want to do that much, right? So on the other hand, we want to be sure that it's strong enough or enforceable enough that it, that it matters. So the short answer is, I don't know where we're going to end up with that, but we're, we're mindful of that. And the, the reality is we are having very honest conversations about that balance and needing to strike it. This is also why it's really important that people like you in this room, people online are engaging in this process and the consultations and in all the invitations that are issued for there to be input because we need to hear from other people actually how we strike that balance too. No, from IHR, I want to talk to WHO financing. Okay. It's a big, you know, it's a big story yesterday with the um, adoption of the recommendations of the working group. Ooh, <laughs> we're getting some class from the, from the room. Um, but we've heard also countries, you know, saying this should be linked mm. to improvements, you know, reforms. And I know WHO has been kind of like this endless reform. <laughs> but um, for the U.S., um, what sort of reforms are you expecting from WHO? Uh, you were, I, you, I mean, I, I just want to quote because uh, yeah. yesterday you made a... Uh, oh, no, did I say something? <laughs> <laughs> Jenny, what are you, no. a reporter? <laughs> so yesterday, um, it, uh, post uh, Dr. Tedros' election, um, he's saying the mm -hmm. truth is there's still much more work to do to modernize WHO yeah. so that it's more effective and agile. Uh -huh. So what reforms are you kind of expecting, like tied to maybe this, yeah. this financing? Okay, so a few, gosh, Jenny, you are really good at this. So um, um, a few things. I mean, one issue that we've been tracking that I think people know is um, uh, the prevention of sexual exploitation and abuse and harassment in WHO's work. Um, so, you know, in addition to caring what, caring about what WHO does day to day, you know, their strategy, their, their three billion, um, we care a lot about how that work gets done. And so that's, you know, coming back to reforms or WHO strengthening, that's largely what we're focused on. So an important example of that is protecting, uh, preventing sexual exploitation, abuse and harassment, especially given the disturbing reports of what happens on the ground during a global health emergency, things are moving so quickly. And sometimes, many times, this can be swept under the rug. And I think all of us have to be saying no more, right? Um, and it's important um, that WHO takes action, not just at the level of headquarters, but at a local level. And it's encouraging that Dr. Tedros and other leadership are being responsive. I think we still want to see um, what their measures or metrics of accountability are across the board. They've taken steps to ensure their uh, protecting uh, and addressing the needs of survivors. I think we can do even more on the prevention side of things, but that's an example 
of the kind of reform we're seeking. But there are other sort of more administrative operational issues that not just the US, but other member states have, have singled out around the budget process, around human resources. Um, so it, it, it's, it's a range of things. And it's not just about Geneva. It's about the work at the country level or regional level, too. Um, I think Tedros was able to do quite a bit here. But I'm not sure if we've seen the extent of what's possible in terms of WHO's evolution, uh, especially regarding its relationship to its country offices or regional staff. Mm -hmm. Now, there's, there's, there's this thing that's gone viral, really. And mm. there's been this narrative that the U.S. proposed amendments will cede country sovereignty mm -hmm. um, to the WHO. Can you comment on that and clarify, please? Okay, can I comment on that? <laughs> I, I would like other people in this room to comment on that partly. Yeah, I, I have been, um, let's just say I have uh, have seen and received many of these messages. Um, and um, look, first, we've been living through a pandemic that's taken a million American lives, six million lives directly around the world, more, um, an estimated 15 million um, that indirectly. The point is, we got to do something about this. Um, so that's number one. Number two, um, we have a couple choices. Um, and again, the choice is not to do nothing, right? Um, we have to do something. Um, but we can work on this international instrument that you mentioned. We can also work towards these international health regulations that, again, are already in place. They were last negotiated um, under the Bush administration, at least for the purposes of the US government, um, back in 2005. But they're over 15 years old, and so we need to and we realized that they didn't quite work the way that they were supposed to come COVID, turns out, right? Um, so that's why we're trying to, to tackle um, the, the international health regulations. Now, what specifically are we trying to do with these changes? Because let's be honest, I think with any sort of um, uh, campaign, we'll call it, um, I think there's legitimate confusion and I also think that there's deliberate misinformation. Um, so what we're trying to do with these changes to the international health regulations is make it so that both countries and WHO can act differently and even better than they did during COVID-19. Nobody wants to be living this nightmare again. And one of the major critiques we all heard about both WHO and some governments is that they didn't share information soon enough, they didn't share as much information as they had available, uh, and neither party acted um, immediately or appropriately. So these tweaks or changes say things like, hey, if you see something happening in your country where people are suddenly starting to die, maybe you wanna let people know. And ideally you let WHO know. And then ideally WHO can maybe tell some other countries what's going on so that they can keep an eye out for some of the same things. And perhaps even start to pull together more health workers or find some supplies that can protect those health workers or otherwise just be ready for what could be coming. Those are the changes we are trying to make. It is not about um, taking away any agency or sovereignty from any individual or from any country or government. Full stop. Yeah. Thank you for clarifying that. I think, you know, addressing misinformation, disinformation is really, really important. Um, we have five minutes, but I want to make sure I, I get all of these questions in. <laughs> Rapid um, fire. <laughs> well, now that WHO has been saying the pandemic is not yet over, mm -hmm. but the U.S. is seemingly moving to a post-pandemic operating model. What does that mean, especially for a lot of countries mm. still, you know, very low vaccination rates, mm. there's still deaths happening. What does that mean for the U.S. global COVID response? Yeah, so I don't know if everyone in the U.S. has um, moved on. My my boss is just now recovered from COVID nineteen, so this is this is something that is very real for us. I still wear my mask um, um, by choice, um, but I, I appreciate your question. Obviously, um, you know we just held a global COVID summit a couple of weeks ago, so I think that that is our response to your question to say we are not forgetting that this is a global problem, including at home. Um, but especially outside our borders, because it's, you know, it's real for many folks um, in a lot of different places. I think what it means for us, though, is um, we want to ensure we're not just talking about vaccines or vaccinations, but we're talking about the full spectrum of the global COVID response, including testing and treatments, things we didn't hear enough about, I think, in the past year. We also are focused on the healthcare workforce and have talked a lot about that in recent weeks. Um, and then finally, um, we still can't forget about 
preparing for the next one um, because unfortunately we could be here again and again. How do we use this momentum to ensure we're pulling together resources so that we can all be stronger and better at this in the years to come? Mm -hmm. um, one thing that's a hot topic now in the mm -hmm. U.S. and I think for the global community, you know, they, they want to get a sense of that, that how this is going to impact your response. Mm -hmm. um, the issue of abortion is currently a hot topic in the U.S. So how much time do we have left? <laughs> government globally Oof, yeah so um <clears throat> these are great questions jenny um look i mean it, it, i know it's a serious issue um that a lot of us are tracking very closely including those of us in the department of me um, uh, and um, and Admiral Levine, who's our Assistant Secretary uh, for Health. And so we stand ready to respond to the decision that we're still waiting on, right? Uh, to... So that's that's one. Two, uh, recognize that it would very well send uh, around the world if the U.S. were to, at a federal level, were to go the way of some states. Uh, and I think it, it has felt, and I've heard, it's been discouraging to many people in other parts of the world um, for us to sort of witness this, this trend. Um, so number three, I think, is, you know, we, even now, but especially later, um, should this come to pass, to learn from others, frankly. Um, I mean, the president talks a lot about our leadership, but how we can lead with humility. And I think one of those moments where we say, look, we're, we're, we're struggling here. Um, and we are going to have to step up and stand up for people, uh, potentially in a way that we never thought we would need to before. Sorry, I'm getting a little emotional talking about this. Um, and so uh, my um, plea um, for people, um, around the world who um, are living as Americans um, in our time um, as, as, as um, in our country um, that we have taken for granted for so long um, and, um, and will absolutely need um, regardless of what happens. Unfortunately, I'm told that we're, we're on time. <laughs> Really sharing all of this insights for to be with us today. Thank you, ever from a, a high level speaker. Have another. So <laughs> <laughs> thank you so much. Thank you.